good evening or late afternoon, I suppose, depending on where you are. Um, thank you very much for joining us at this very exciting webinar. Um, this is what we're calling part two to our science of reading in 30 minutes or less, which is really a series that Shannon and I are, are kind of putting together specifically for the librarian about this kind of juggernaut of 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 information that's been coming through and, and it can just feel really overwhelming. So we wanted to take some time to use like our expertise and our passion and and share with you what we've already learned to hopefully make sure that, you know, not every, you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. Um, this is an extension from the first one. So there is a lot of information that was shared in the very first webinar, which is linked on the webinars page. And it was in the email that you received to sign up. Um, so I, I highly recommend going back and listening to that. If there's anything that we're talking about that sounds a little confusing or new, um, otherwise we're really kind of moving past that and looking at some more specifics about putting some of these best practices into motion. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. That way, anyone who isn't able to make it will be sending out uh, an email with the recording afterwards. Or, you know, if there's just something that you really want to rewatch or need to listen to over again, we will have it for you right there. As always, any questions that you have, just go ahead and, and, and fire them off. We'll always be looking at the chat. You don't have to wait until the end, although we will designate some time to answer questions at the end, but definitely let them go as you think of them. That way we don't miss out on anything. As is customary in everything or in every presentation for someone that works at Capstone, we like to start off by kind of sharing our purpose and our core values. Um, and they are something that I hold very near and dear uh, the purpose of Capstone is, is honestly, it's why I work here. It was what I prided myself on when I was in the classroom. And it's just that we help kids succeed by making learning fun. We know that kids aren't really going to engage with learning if they're not having a good time. And, and Capstone's here to really kind of embody that and make sure that we're making content and we're making resources that students and teachers are going to want to use rather than just the stuff that they're told they need to use. Our core values are up here on the screen. I think everybody that is attending and, and everyone that I work with here at Capstone embodies these on a daily basis, but more than anything else, you know, especially for someone like Shannon who's flying in so late and is still here, you know, after a full work day, I would say that our hearts and minds are obviously committed to our purpose. Anyone that's here is looking to get more information, more resources, and really we're all just here to make sure that we can help out with our kids. To introduce us, um, I'm sure all of you know, uh, but if you don't, I'm joined by Shannon Miller, who's district teacher librarian. She's the future ready librarian, and she has so, so many titles. Um, I'm really excited to, to have her here for this because she gets to share actual examples where we put some of this information into practice, which is just so amazing. So Shannon, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Yeah, always a pleasure. And I am Joe Burns. I work here uh, at Capstone. I've been here for about two and a half years, com coming up on three pretty soon. As it says, former educator, I taught for about 10 years, kindergarten, third, fourth grade, wore a variety of other administrator -y hats. But really, it, it, it's the teacher that matters. And it was the teacher one that I had the most fun. If you're new to Capstone, a little introduction to who we are. Um, we are a publishing and ed tech company. We have a variety of different content for kids to engage and consume and learn from. Uh, we have everything is pretty much available in print as hardcover or paperback. Our books are also available as what we like to call interactive eBooks, which are done with read along audio with live text tracking by a real person. PebbleGo and PebbleGo Next is our nonfiction databases. Um, they're amazingly easy to navigate, chock full of great information. You'll see plenty of examples and screenshots of them here today. And Capstone Connect is our more teacher-focused portal where 
you can go and, and find content by standards, by your state. You can get some rice, easy, ready to go uh, lesson plans. It's just a really nice little hub to search any of the content that you currently have in the Capstone ecosystem. So without further ado, um, we're going to move on to part two of Science of Reading in 30 minutes. I hope 30 minutes. Um, so quick agenda, we're going to very, very briefly overview what the science of reading is and isn't. I'll make that super, super short because we went over it in great detail in part one. And then we're going to look at how we can motivate some students and really just some quick ways to help kids pick up books more often, especially for you in the library. We're going to look at the power of read alouds and, and listening comprehension, understanding how those listening comprehension skills can affect reading comprehension. We're going to look at some ideas of and the importance of building background knowledge um, and building content area knowledge. And then Shannon's really going to show us how all of those things actually work in the library with students and how you can work with teachers to really improve the reading efficacy and reading instruction that kids are receiving. So as a recap, what is the science of reading? Well, it's a body of research. It's all we really need to know. It's a body of research from a variety of different disciplines, ranging from educators to neuroscientists to cognitive scientists to anthropologists. It's just a variety of different people trying to figure out how is it exactly that we acquire written language and what are some best practices or some things that we can take out of that knowledge to help students become better readers. What it's not, it's not something that you can buy. It's not for sale. It's just a body of research. It's not a program. It's not a set of standards. It's not any of those things. It really is just a lot of scientific research, as the name may imply, that tells us that there are some ways that we can pay attention to help kids become the best readers that they are. If you want to hear a little bit more about that, all of the key pillars, how things work together, definitely go back, listen to part one. We go into, into pretty great detail there. So first things first, we need to get kids to pick up books because when it comes down to it, getting kids to read really can be half, if not more than half the battle. We know that regardless of what side of the reading wars you're on, if that's what you want to call it, how long you've been teaching for, where you are in your career or your location, there's really been a few universal truths when it comes to reading instruction, and it's that kids just need to read. There's no theory that's in practice that says more reading is bad. We just need kids to pick up books. In fact, we need kids to be completely immersed in reading, just like if you were trying to learn a new language to be fluent in and you were trying to acquire some language, it'd be best if you could move to that area and be totally immersed in it. And I understand how difficult that can be. Um, you know, I, I read something the other day in Ed Week that says kids right now on average are engaged in screen time between you know, TV or I would guess more likely YouTube and Twitch and video games to up to six and a half hours per day, which is like a little bit more than 25% of an entire day, not even taking into account the hours that they're actually sleeping, right? To put that in perspective, your kids are sleeping on average about 40 to 50% of the day, and they're in school for almost exactly 25% of the day. So they're spending an equal amount of time on these screens as they are in school. So that's absolutely ridiculous. And yeah, if you add these things up, you're looking at, you know, 90 plus percent of, of the day is between these three things. So when are kids picking up books and reading? And the answer is they're probably not, at least not often enough, and definitely not the kids that are struggling. So the first thing that we can look at to help kids pick up some books and hopefully some ways that Capstone can really help is Providing students with some form of agency around reading, especially for struggling readers. Reading can be a really, really stressful situation. I know that it was not my favorite thing to do when I was in elementary school. And the least, not the least of it was because of the books that I was forced to read and the way that I was forced to interact with them. Now, I'm old, so that's all archaic and outdated and people aren't doing that anyway. But 
reading Island of the Blue Dolphins is what made me think that I wasn't a good reader or I didn't like it because it turns out that's not a particularly great way to motivate kids to read. The most obvious and most simple way that we can give kids some agency is by giving them some choice around reading, choice in a variety of different aspects. Cover a couple here, the most obvious of which is what kids are reading. Now, what they're reading doesn't need to be a complete and total free for all because we can allow them to choose, you know, it could just be the format of the book. They could be reading it as an ebook on a computer or on a tablet. We could be letting them engage with print. We could be letting them listen to an audiobook. We could let kids pick a genre to read from. That's another way to infuse some choice and some agency. And if you need to have some control over it yourself, you can still provide choice by giving them a list of your rules and your bumpers that you've put up, put up and allow them to pick from that. But letting kids have some form of choice as to what texts and they're going to be interacting with is a really great way to help them feel like they have agency over their day. And it really is going to help with motivation in hopes that they can pick up and engage with it a little bit more. When is a little bit harder, especially for librarians. I know you only you only have your kids for 45 minutes to an hour, but in general, in the classroom or at home, when is pretty simple. You know, it could be, I want you to read your 20 minutes. Do you want to do it right when you get home or do you want to do it before bed? Do you want to do it at the beginning of the day while kids are putting all of their stuff away or do you want to do it at the end of the day while kids are packing up? Do you want to do it at a random time as one of your choice board activities in my class? There's a lot of different ways that you can infuse the when, and that that really has to come down to how long you have your kids and how long they interact for. Where and who? This is such an easy one. Um, and this was one that was really powerful for me in the classroom. My kids wanted to pretty much work anywhere except for where I had set them up to work, right? It'd be great if they would work at their desk, but if I let them go underneath their desk, that was like the coolest thing ever. Not just reading, we did some spelling upside down on our desk, right? You tape it up there, boom, now you can do your words their way, do their developmental spelling assessment, ready to go. I had kids bringing in their stuffies for their free time because for some reason, reading to one of their stuffies was way better than reading independently at their table. If you live in a nice area that has it and it's nice out going outside, huge, all really simple ways that you can give kids some choice, even if you're telling them every other component, even if you're telling them you have to read this passage at this time, but you can let them pick who they're reading to, who they're reading with, where they're reading it. And the last one, which is by far the absolute most complicated and is like the highest, most divine purpose that we can have is really trying to tie some meaning to why kids are interacting with books. And we're going to, the slide after this, we'll look at a pitfall that I know I fell into really, really often in the classroom, but there's nothing more combative and demotivating to a kid. And really to just us and as humans in general, than when you ask like, what's the purpose of doing something? And the response is like, you just have to, just because, because I said so, just because. So giving kids some actual understanding around why reading is really important or giving them genuine reasons to read is a great way to motivate them to pick up books more often. And like we said before, getting them to read is going to be half the battle in building content knowledge and building reading comprehension skills. Doing things like showing them that you can learn new skills from reading a book. The one that I engaged with the most in my classroom was that like, this is the best way to win arguments. <laughs> because if you can come to an argument with facts on your side that you can point to, you're going to win that argument. And that was super motivating to my fourth graders. Um, you know, helping them complete a project, or if you want to kind of practice what you teach and show them things that you're reading and that you love and that you enjoy, you can be that conduit to show them that reading is also something you can do to have fun and feel good in the same way that watching something on Netflix can, but in a slightly different way. Something to kind of stay away from, which I know is really, really difficult to do, but I, and I was super guilty of it, but having that super required reading or attaching the fact that like reading is just an avenue to more work, right? Reading as a punishment. You were talking in my class, 10 minutes of reading at recess. It's like, 
the ab- I mean, it's the absolute base, most basic way to make a kid feel like reading is not for them. Or what's more is almost every time a kid reads between the hours of 830 and 330 or whatever your school day is, usually it means they have something to do with it right? They read a book, they have to do a project. They read a book, they have to answer questions. They read a book, they have to write down something. There's always more work that comes with it. So being cognizant of like, not always attaching work and negatives and requirements to reading to help show them that joy to get them to engage a little bit more often. As librarians, read alouds are super duper powerful, not the least of which is because at those kindergarten, first, second grade uh, years, listening is the skill that comes before reading. Kids can't learn letter sound correspondence until they have mastered their listening skills. And that makes a lot of sense because listening is the way that we naturally acquire language. Um, written language is is not something that's super duper naturally occurring and our brains are not wired for it on their own. And there's a lot that can be said from just enjoying some targeted read alouds in your classroom to help kids develop their phonological and phonemic awareness. Some skills with phonological awareness, which is really your ability to hear and differentiate between individual sounds at those early grade levels. You can do things like onset rhyme. You can do regular rhymes and alliteration in some of those stories. You can chunk out syllables with your kids. And then as they start to get better at identifying sounds and patterns of those sounds, you can start weaving in some phonemic awareness. So start doing some things where as you're reading, you can ask kids to mess around with the words that you've been reading. So if a kid says some, or if you read a story and I don't know, the last word on the page is cat and you ask a kid to replace the k with an m sound and then figure out what's that new word. Being able to actually manipulate the sounds, isolate and change them around is a great way to help them become skilled at actually blending sounds together to form words, which is what we do when we're asking kids to read. Because we can't expect students to read and sound things out until they can differentiate between all of those sounds, right? And sounds and phonemes are like this really complicated big thing, right? We're asking kids, you know, if we're asking a kid to say or read the word box, they actually need to know four individual sounds. They need to be able to listen to and hear four sounds because X is not just one sound, it's two, it's a combination of sounds. So at those lower grades, that kind of reading is a great way to help and reinforce and help support some phonics instruction that's going on in the classroom. Read alouds also are a great way to access a couple of different modalities of learning. We know that kids are definitely, um, you really not just kids, but all humans have preferences for the way that they learn things. You could be a visual learner. You may be an auditory learner. You could be a kinesthetic learner. I know my sister was definitely a kinesthetic learner, but I was 100% a uh, speaking and reading and writing person. I had to hear it and then write things down in order to remember it. So doing some learning with read alouds is a great way to help those auditory learners access some new knowledge and some new content. And it reinforces it for everyone else. It's also a great way to help kids get some practice with listening comprehension. Anytime I looked at any of my state benchmark tests um, for reading, there are two areas every year that always scored shockingly low and lower than um, lower than average. And it was listening comprehension and nonfiction text. The nonfiction text I get, those are really difficult. They're high level. There's certainly a skill floor to be able to access and comprehend that stuff. But listening comprehension was crazy to me until I really looked into it and I thought, you know, getting information from listening is is really difficult and it's still really important, right? Because as kids, they have limited vocabulary and experiences and they tend to have a little bit of a shorter attention span. And when you compound that with the fact that the stimulus that they're trying to get information from disappears as soon as it's done, it makes sense that listening comprehension is really hard. They also have 
very limited exposure to different types of spoken language. Sure, they've got plenty of experience in like that informal conversation that they have with their kids while you're trying to teach them long division, but they're probably not particularly practiced at listening to formal speech and storytelling where you need to be actively listening and trying to tie meaning to the words that are being said. So if you can provide some practice for that in your classroom, it's a great way to help them A, build knowledge, but B, kind of improve those listening comprehension strategies. There's also just so many benefits to it. I mean, if you think about how kids progress through grades and how teaching tends to change as you progress through grades, especially through college, there's a huge increase in that teacher-led instruction through the grades. There's way more park and bark going on where they stand up and they talk and you're expected to listen and take notes. Um, they also, at the same time, are more accountable for their learning. And it's not just learning in school and facts and grades. It's also really helpful for things like their social emotional experiences and their ability to build relationships. It's a great way to show empathy and that you care is having good listening skills. Lastly, some ways that you can kind of help out in the classroom or help out those classroom educators through the library is just that like you can help build content area knowledge, right? The more someone knows about the topic they're reading about, the easier it's going to be for them to comprehend it when they're interacting with that text. Um, you know, we've all seen Scarborough's Reading Rope, which is really just an evolution of this simplistic view of reading. The idea that your ability to pick words off of a page combined with your ability to understand language components results in your ability to comprehend the text that you read or reading comprehension and that these things work together where if you are a robot and pick words up off a page read 240 words correct per minute with absolutely zero errors no problem whatsoever but you have zero vocabulary you have very limited experiences you're not going to comprehend anything that you read in fact, a kid that has flawless decoding skills with zero comprehension skills is going to be less successful than a kid that's behind in grade level, but at least has some knowledge base to pull from because it all works together to help you out. And that's really, really important thing for us to understand. We know that when we learn, we can either accommodate knowledge or we can assimilate knowledge. And if you're there to help kids build that background area or that background knowledge, build that content area knowledge by sharing things in the classroom, um, you know, a bunch of different ways and strategies that Shannon will be touching on. Um, but just like the basic human psychology of it is it's really easy for us to learn things when we're able to take the things we already know and slowly attach them. We can then grow the things that we already know. But if we have absolutely no knowledge of that topic. We have no knowledge of that vocabulary. We have to build an entirely separate catalog or category for it. And it's a lot more difficult for kids to retain and to be able to apply that kind of knowledge. So the more often you can expose them to new knowledge and help them build connections to the things that they already know, the more successful they're going to be moving forward. It's really important if you're helping kids build that content area knowledge, it's very important that you give kids a variety of text and formats to help them build their content area knowledge. It's giving them nonfiction text. It's giving them expository. It's giving them the form in a book. It's giving them in article form. It's helping them learn all of the text features in nonfiction so that they can interact with it. Um, and what you can do there is really just pull all of the things that you have a variety of different lengths and sizes and formats and align it with some of the teaching and learning that's helping in the classroom with classroom educators. It's also important that we're not just giving these kids books and saying, read them, you will learn the things if you read them. That's like learning by osmosis, which we know is not a particularly great thing uh, for students. And it's kind of the antithesis of the science of reading, which is saying, hey, you need to give kids the opportunity to learn things explicitly and sequentially and in isolation before you ask them to pull in other skills at the same time. Um, so making sure that you every once in a while stop and model how you would interact with these texts and show them how you would try to learn from them is a great way to help kids gain some of that content area knowledge. 
Lastly, we know that kids are struggling. It is really difficult. We know that kids specifically are struggling with the actual decoding component of reading, but it's really important to make sure that we're not just giving them watered down resources because we know that oftentimes when kids struggle with reading and we want to move into science or social studies, we're doing something on like the water cycle, or we're doing something on animal adaptations, if it's a struggling learner, we tend to also just give them lower grade level stuff, which comes with a lack of the same vocabulary. It's usually shorter. It usually doesn't go into as much depth about the topic. And we're really kind of setting that kid behind now in two different ways, because they're already behind with their decoding. And now we're setting them up for failure for acquiring new knowledge as well. So making sure that you have great strategies and great scaffolds like the ones that you would find in Pebble Go or in Capstone Interactive so that you can bring kids up to that content rather than bringing the content down to them. Something as simple as the natural voice read aloud and the in live interactive text that's found in every single one of our digital products and content is a great way to let kids not focus on the decoding part while still building that set of knowledge. With all of that, Shannon's going to show us how these things actually come into play with your students in your classroom, working with teachers, and really is, is the actual expert in all of these things. So I'm going to give up control and, and let her walk through all of this in context, give it some real meaning. Thank you, Joe. Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. And let me know that you can see it okay. <clears throat> looks good to me awesome well it was it's so interesting always to listen to you joe and um you are an expert too because you were a teacher my friend and so i think it's neat how you bring all these things together and i went to school today and taught a bunch of lessons that really you know we think about this in our library and we go to our classrooms and we collaborate and all the things that we see it really does put it into action, the things that you were talking about. And so we're going to just start with motivating our students with choice. And I, this time of year, you know, I can't say that enough. We, we start thinking about the end of the year and we're even thinking about summer reading. And we know that our kids love reading all different types of genre and in a variety of formats and on various devices. And I think that's one thing that's really exciting for kids because they can now read with a book or they can read an ebook or maybe they're reading on, you know, their parents' phone if they're on the go or at a ball game or something. And so I it it's important for us to make sure that we are thinking about that and just empowering our kids that, you know, whatever they're doing, they're reading and they're readers and we want them to love it. And so finding places where they can cozy up and read and finding fun places, giving them ideas. And when they're like this, they're more likely to engage in reading when we empower them with these choices that really fit their needs and interests. So I think that's important for us to remember. One thing at Van Meter that we love to do is celebrate our readers. And this time of year is great for that because, you know, we just had Read Across America and we have Poetry Month next month. We have Children's Book Week in May. And one thing we did last year was had the kids bring their favorite book and we took pictures of all of our kids and made these little like stickers for their lockers and it was so fun to see how excited they were but again to celebrate whatever kind of reader they are and what they love to read one thing that we did with our capstone books and this was a few years ago we wanted to start giving our kids more choice in what they were even reading in our book clubs and within our classrooms and so we started these pop-up libraries throughout our school that gives the kids and the teachers a lot of different choice, but we pair it up to with even our eBooks that we have in Capstone Interactive. And I love this because we made these choice boards and the teachers, they would print off like the choice board, what it actually looked like. And the kids would then use those kind of as their tickets as they read through all of these books. And so they had just a binder 
and they had the print off of the choice board in there, just really simple. And then the kids could grab whatever character or whatever book that they wanted to read. And we found that their reading went up so much in just what they were reading, not only in their book clubs, but even for pleasure within their classrooms. And so again, you know, tying into their interests, making things available for them and making it really fun. And so it really, it really did work. And it's something that we continue to build on too. And then during this um, section too, I wanted to mention how important nonfiction is. And even when they're going on Pebble Go, or if they're going into nonfiction texts, like within Capstone Interactive or from the shelf, that is something that is super interesting to kids. And so we do a lot with Pebble Go and Pebble Go Next in our school. And one new thing that we just created a few weeks ago, and my daughter Brianna helped me make these for our kids at Van Meter, and it was so fun because the kids can actually write down their favorite articles, and so they can go to Pebble Go or Pebble Go Next, they can even like write them down within the month, and all of these things will share the slides and they're linked in there, so you'll be able to find the templates to use these as well. And then one other really fun way, Capstone makes these great calendars each month. And what I do is I take them and put them into a choice board and then link all the different articles. And it gives the kids a place to explore these special little dates and things that we have that maybe we want our kids to experience. But I print it off. I share it to online. I give it to the teachers and they post them. And the kids have so much fun, not only researching, but they even go into their Pebble Go Create that we have right inside of Pebble Go. And they're able then to make a little buncy. And so they really like being able to explore those. And then one more thing I did around Pebble Go and this is something that we are going to continue to do each month is just made this big poster that linked to all of the articles that were popular, most popular and most read by kids around the U.S. in 2023. And now each month we're going to share this with the kids. And it was so fun to see how excited they were, not only to see it online, but even to see these posters that we put up in their classroom. So just giving them options giving them ideas, giving them new things that they might want to read about is really exciting for them too. The next thing are read alouds and listening comprehension. And again, there are so many ways that we can, you know, really share special read alouds and foster that listening comprehension. As a librarian, one of my favorite things to do is to read aloud to our kids in the library, but I also love to make sure that our teachers have really great books to read aloud to our kids in the classroom. So I put together each month these little book hubs and I fill them up with just great read alouds for our teachers. Our kids love them because they know that every month there's going to be like 36 new books and it gets them so excited. And then I put it together with a little virtual one too that I'll tell you more about in a few minutes. Another thing that we remember to get the kids really excited is anything we can do to connect them like maybe it is in a Zoom with a special author. Maybe it's something that we can bring that ties into like a new series. And Jessica, who wrote the Naomi Nash, she's wonderful because she did these great Zooms with our kids. And this was a brand new series to our kids last year. And they were so excited because we were able to put some really exciting information around the Naomi Nash. And, and if you haven't seen this series, it's so cute because she loves snakes. And so it was so fun to hear like all about snakes and the kids got so excited. But then what I did is just put together a choice board that was filled with like books that were from Capstone Interactive, Pebble Go About Snakes. And I printed these off, put a QR code, and I put these with just a little bit of glue in the front of our Naomi Nash books. And it was so fun because the kids were able to connect then with even more knowledge of what they were reading. So getting them excited, not only about those read alouds and things, but really taking it to that next level and tying it into things that they were learning too. And one thing that I wanted to point out about 
our virtual book hub is how great the Capstone Interactive books are for listening. And the kids love going to these each month. They can also go to Capstone Interactive active and they can read any of the books that we have, but how they can listen and not only at school, but at home too, really supports that listening comprehension that we're working on with our kids. And the last thing is just building that content knowledge. And again, like we know that through pre-teaching support and review and by collaborating with the classroom teachers, we're making a huge impact as librarians and really aligning to what they teach is so helpful for them, but also really enhances the learning of our kids. It's a great way to support as librarians and as teachers too. I look at, this is a calendar that I use and we start this at the beginning of each year. And every month I look at what my teachers are doing and how I can tie in. And the teachers, they put in maybe the different topics that we're focusing on, or they might email me about things that we're doing. And then I go out and I find the best things I can. I maybe make a choice board. I find the books that we have. I make sure that we have what like is um, connected maybe in Pebble Go or Pebble Go Next. And putting these things together, this is something that we probably started uh, probably during like COVID. And for the last four years, we've really been building on how we're like curating our resources and how we're approaching this on how we're getting them to our kids in a really interesting and interactive ways. And so this is something that is great because I use my, just my Capstone Connect and I will search for any topics. For example, when our first graders were learning all about dental health and all about teeth, I was able to find like really great books and all the articles that I wanted to include in that choice board. And so it makes it really easy to be able to find those and put together those choice boards. A project that we started today, which I just loved, I did this with my third grade teacher and she came to me and she wanted a new idea on just how to approach like two things that she wanted the kids to write about opinion. And so we put together two ebooks and this is a great series, just places we live. And we gave them the choice of living on a mountain or by the ocean. And so they did some research and they filled out just this little graphic organizer. And then we used storyboard that for the kids to create then their own little like comic strip with five different cells. And this project, we just started it today and it was so fun to see what the kids wrote, but also to watch what they are putting into storyboard that. So just thinking about things in fun, creative ways, it does really make that learning and the comprehension that they have come to life. And so I put a link in here to storyboard that because it's something that I would definitely check out it. It's fun for all ages in so many different ways. And then the other thing that we use all the time is our Create and Pebble Go. And I actually use with, with this with our kindergartners today for their animal research projects. But I love that when we go into our Pebble Go with this little add-on of Create, the kids then can click on that and they can then show and tell and they can do all kinds of things within Create to, again, really make their learning come to life. And so they can add stickers and text and they can add voice or video. And it's so neat to see, you know, not only what they create, but how I think different that it is. Maybe some kids like to draw, some kids like to type or find stickers, and it really gives the kids that platform that they need to just be able to explore and also tell what they're learning. And so when we have a project like this is a great example of giving them maybe a choice board with some books or Pebble Go, whatever resources you want to put on there, and then giving them a place that then they can go in and they can be creative. And like in this one, our kids use just the pixel art from Stick Together, used all that knowledge that they had, what they learned, and then they created something just really neat and creative with the pixel art platform from Stick Together. So I love projects like this. It's so neat to see like how you can take something that they're learning about and switch it up and make it so exciting for them, 
more exciting for us too as teachers because our kids are being collaborative and creative and they're having so much fun connecting to these great learning tools. I write about these projects and a whole lot more on my blog. So I wanted to put a link in there too, but I'm so glad I got to share these examples, Joe. And it's yeah. always fun to be able to talk about how we use Pebble Go and all the great things from Capstone too. So thank you. Absolutely. And it's always great to have someone who who's still putting it into practice because I can come up here and wax poetic all you want, but it's not really true until you can see someone actually doing it because it's in my experience it's never exactly the way that it's advertised right it's <laughs> so. pretty fun well and today you know thinking about today and all the things we did you know from our kindergartners creating as they were learning about their animals and how we use things in third grade like it's just so fun to think about all the ways that we take this, you know, platform and we take these books that our kids love and how we really make it into something really creative and special for them every day. Yeah. We we thank you for it too. And and speaking of ooh, oh no, didn't go to the right one. I was gonna have such a good transition and I messed it up. Uh and speaking of, there we go. Um, am I still sharing or no? No, not now. Interesting. Well then, that's so sad. We'll get rid of this. And we're just going to have to do it this way. How about now? Am I still yeah. am I sharing now? We good? There we go. Speaking of, you know, having some experts who can really speak to using the content and kind of share that passion, I do really want to share something that I am so excited about. At Capstone, we're super excited about uh, releasing Stairway Decodables, which is uh, our take on uh, a phon a supplemental phonics resource that you can use in your classroom. But equally as excited, at least I am, is that my friend um, and real life superhero, uh, Hillary, is going to be doing a little webinar on just phonics instruction in general. It should be really great for people that are feeling that push of spending a lot more time on sequential phonics instruction in the classroom. Or if you're in a position like a librarian um, or any specials area at all, and you're wondering how these resources are used or what the basics of phonics instruction look like, this is a great one for you to join. She's been teaching kindergarten for 18 years. She was teacher of the year. She's getting her doctoral uh, degree in social emotional learning and educational leadership. She's got a special ed certification. Um, and she, much like Shannon, is going to get to actually take the things that we've made and, and show you how to use them and, and when you're using them and, and get to see some actual examples of kids interacting with these things to really kind of understand what some of these best practices are. So if you want to scan here, that would be great. Otherwise, I will toss a link in the chat in a moment. It does seem like my Zoom and PowerPoint are fighting, so I will do that after I stop sharing my screen. Um, but this one I'm so excited about. She is an incredible human. I urge anybody to go online and just look into her a little bit. I, I'm not kidding when I say she's basically a real life superhero. Um, also, if you're new to Capstone and all of this content, all this information sounds really interesting to you, you love seeing some of the ways that Shannon has been using things like Pebble Go uh, or our eBooks, and you would love to be able to bring them into your classroom, we are running a summer pilot right now, which essentially, if you fill out the form at capstonepub.com backslash summer hyphen access, I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, someone will get back to you and they will get you set up so that you can use this content between now and the end of the year and your kids will know how to use it in the summer in hopes that honestly kids just read sometimes over the summer we know they've got an iPhone and if they don't then you might 
or you probably do. And we know that nine times out of 10, that tablet at dinner, that tablet and the phone on the way to grandma's house is probably chilling on Roblox. But if you sign up for this, you'll have access to like, all of the articles, all the awesome fantasy novels and the fiction and the realistic fiction and any topic that they're interested about just really want kids to read. So go ahead, come here, sign up for it, and we'll get you all set up so that you can have everything that you need in order to understand the benefits of really the capstone universe, if you will. Otherwise, um, if you have questions, you think of them later, please feel free to reach out. You can reach out to me. I know Shannon is also always available. Um, we're here to help. We genuinely just want to make sure that we can help kids succeed. Uh, that's that's why we're all here for the most part. Not for the most part, entirely why we're all here. So otherwise, Shannon, it was great to see you. And I'll see you in, in a little less than a month. Uh, and good luck on, on all your travels. Thank you, friend. Thanks for having me. And to everyone else, thank you so much for coming. I see uh, one question. Yes, you will get access to the slides, 100%. Um, after this, there will be an email that went out to everybody who registered, especially those who came, um, that will have a recording if you want to rewatch anything. Um, I'll try to timestamp it on YouTube as well, so that way you can scrub through and find the stuff that's actually interesting and relevant to you. I'm sure there are things uh, that are more interesting and otherwise um, yeah you'll get the email and you'll get you'll get the slides so awesome and that seems like pretty much all the questions so I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here and I'll drop my links in the chat for people and otherwise we'll be able to make it a make it a good night thanks Joe yeah, have a good one.